KBLA Talk 1580. <laughs> That's the walk on music for Dr. Gerald Horn. And I'm so happy to welcome him in. I want to remind you, though, first, that today's uh, presentation of First Things First is brought to you by Wealth Management Financial Advisors, offering tax services, financial planning, and more. If you're a nonprofit organization or a small business, they can help you get on track. Find them at wealthmanagementlb.com. That is wealthmanagementlb.com. Okay, you can turn that back up. <laughs> he is one of our premier scholars. He's an historian uh, with the John J. and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's the author of a whole bunch of books uh, that you can find wherever you buy your books. Um, and he is also a YouTube scholar now. Just type in Dr. Gerald Horn and you're going to see a whole bunch of his lectures. Dr. Horn, good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for coming on. It's always great to hear from you. And I want to do it at the beginning rather than at the very end when we only have 12 seconds left Talk to me about your latest book. Books, well, I should say. Week, oh, right. Just this week, a volume dropped uh, entitled Acknowledging Radical Histories, Conversations with Gerald Horn. It's edited by a young scholar out of Colorado. And as I've seen more yesterday's than I'll see tomorrow's, I'm trying to bring to center stage more younger scholars, which brings me to a book that will drop within a few days entitled I Dare Say, uh, the Gerald Horn Reader, edited by a young scholar out of Great Britain, and uh, I recommend them to your audience. Wow. Congratulations. Two, um, two sort of anthologies, I guess, sounds like, of your work. Yes, that is true. The first one is, is sort of a cliff note version of many of the books I've published in recent decades. And the second one consists of articles and essays and reviews that I've published in recent decades. That's good stuff. And of course, we can find them, um, find them at a black bookstore near you. If you can't, then go to Amazon. You'll find them there. So we were talking before you came on, Dr. Horn, about Fonnie Willis and, and the, all of the attacks on her <clears throat> and, you know, um, how vicious they are and how she's pushing back. And I wonder, we talked a little bit about this before, the commission that's been seated that could possibly remove her. We've talked about how the governor, uh, Brian Kemp, governor uh, of Georgia, is saying he's, he's not going to move on his part to unseat her. How much of a threat, um, you know, to the investigation, to the cases, but also to her personal safety do you think these attacks are? Well, with regard to the latter, you may have noticed that she's not only beefed up her security, she's asking that jurors in these upcoming cases, uh, a couple of which will begin within a month or so, that they have security as well. And what I find striking about the recent attacks, not only on uh, Bonnie Willis, but also on Judge Chutkin, recall that she's the woman of Jamaican ancestry who's presiding over the federal case in Washington, D.C., targeting Mr. Trump. Uh, just like uh, the Trump forces have attacked Bonnie Willis and her father, John Lloyd, because of allegations about his being part of the Black Panther Party, Judge Chutkin comes from an eminent left-wing Jamaican family. And that has become a point of attack by Mr. Trump. But it also points to, uh, as you know more than most, the ideological diversity of many Black families. <laughs> yeah, and I do think that um, it, it's there's this escalation of tone. We we we've seen signs um, going up at some of these Trump rallies and stuff. Trump or death. I've, it feels like an escalation of the violent rhetoric coming out of the MAGA camp. And clearly, let me point you to what Donna uh, Brazil said. Recall that she is the black woman who managed the Al Gore campaign in 2000, a former leader of the Democratic National Committee. She has raised alarm bells. She's suggesting that this is a movement, this Trump 
campaign. It's more than just a political campaign. And there are others who are saying more or less the same thing. And I think that they should be heated. They should be taken seriously. Yeah, I, it, it's, it's worrisome because, you know, where that goes is very, um, it's problematic. You know, you look at these countries where political assassinations are the norm. Um, Middle Eastern countries, uh, Central American countries. And it seems like we could be moving in that direction. Well, we've experienced an attempted coup on January 6, 2021. Now you see that in Colorado, there's an attempt to bar Mr. Trump from the ballot. This Yay. Is <laughs> a lengthy analysis of the 14th Amendment, which says that folks who are engaged in insurrection should not be allowed to occupy an office or even be on the ballot. But I think that it's a valid historical argument to be Sure. On the other hand, I can't think of anything more designed to inflame the Trump base. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, that's, and it's already doing it, even though it hasn't um, been successfully, you know, applied anywhere. It seems like California would be a great candidate for that, since we're supposedly a blue state. Um, I say supposedly. I didn't realize we had more Republicans in this state than any other of the 49 uh, states of the union. Well, of course, that's a historic legacy of Ronald Wilson Reagan, Pete Wilson, Richard Nixon. And you have to keep an eye on those Republicans in the state of California because they've been trying all sorts of tricks to try to maintain power, including the so-called jungle primary, the top two. They thought that that would lead to their being able to sneak into, say, the governor's mansion the way that Arnold Schwarzenegger snuck into the governor's mansion a few years ago. But we have to keep our eye on those folks because they have a bag full of dirty tricks. Yeah, you know what? And it's funny that you, you, you chuckle about that because I don't think it's gone too well for them as far as these top two primaries. What ends up happening is that we don't have a Republican candidate uh, in many of these races at all because they they don't even make it into the runoff. They don't make it past the primary. Okay, last time we talked, Dr. Horn, um, I I started to ask you about the Wagner Group, what happens uh, now that um, their leader is supposedly, uh, Prigozhin is pr- supposedly dead in that plane crash. And I was talking to some experts that I know about Africa. They were saying... Um, that, you know, what we already know, which is that the Wagner Group has been involved in a lot of these coups. They're a mercenary army for hire, which means many times they're going to be on the wrong side of um, the politics of Africa, right? And now, without their head uh, there, what happens? I want to talk about that when we come forward. also didn't realize quite how um, how murderous they are, you know, how beyond, above and beyond whatever their assignment is for hire, how uh, murderous this, this group has been, and what the potential possibilities are for them uh, as a headless organization uh, still doing business in places like Africa. I'm Dominique DePrima. Dr. Gerald Horn is with us, and you're listening to KBLA Talk 1580. Out loud. loud. KBLA Talk 1580. Hi, it's Tavis Smiley. KBLA Talk 1580 is inviting you to join us on Saturday, September 16th, 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. for our very first economic empowerment event for the community. This event is free and it's powered by Caltrans. We're doing this in association with Rambo House. And here's Rambo to tell you more. Contracts, contracts, contracts. I'm going to say it again for all of us small business owners out there. Contracts, contracts, contracts. Rambo House. KBLA, Tavis, me, oh my God, this is going to be massive. I truly thank Caltrans for giving us the opportunity to focus on contracts. Listen, that's what it's all about to be a small business in L.A. That's how we hire our own. That's how we expand our community is contracts. KBLA1580.com is for you to have a seat at our contracts-focused event. Contract Ready does it again. We had over 900 last time. So you guys know how exciting this is. And if you just think, think, 
that you want to get in the contract and you're close to it, bring your friends out for September 16th at the Marriott Hotel. Listen, you know where to register. KBLA1580.com. Come see me. I can't wait to see you. Let's do it, Tavis. So be sure to go to KBLA1580.com for all the details. We'll see you Saturday, September 16th. She's so small. I'm interrupting my own shower to remind you to treat your skin like the queen she is with Olay Hyaluronic Body Wash. Packed with Olay's highest level of vitamin B3 complex. It's so moisturizing that it will give you visibly smoother, head-turning skin in just 14 days. People wondering, how'd she get so smooth? Olay Hyaluronic Body Wash. Also, try Olay Hyaluronic Body Lotion. On your period. Sudden gushes happen without warning. But now, you can say goodbye to stand-up gush fears. Thanks to Always Ultra Thins with Rapid Dry technology. It absorbs gushes two times faster than the leading store brand and gives you up to 100% leak-free protection. Hello clean and comfortable with Always Fear No Gush. Thanks for waking up with Dominique DePrima on KBLA Talk 1580. Talking with Dr. Gerald Horn, uh, I dare say, coming out this week, uh, and uh, an anthology of Dr. Gerald Horn's work and acknowledging radical history conversations with Dr. Gerald Horn is out right now. So, uh, where to start? Okay, I, I teed up the Wagner group, so let's talk about that. What what is happening with this group? How how dangerous is this situation now that they're I guess reshuffling leadership or in disarray? And why don't we hear more about this group before this dude was killed? I mean, I think we started hearing more about it when they said they were going to do a coup on Putin. But you know, considering this is massive mercenary army that's functioning in Africa and other places. I, I'm surprised it's not more reporting on this. Well, it's a contradictory phenomenon. What I mean by that is that they were invited into a number of African countries, uh, Mali, Central African Republic, for example, because of the fear of these religious zealots. Uh, speaking of religious zealots, we talked about Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, uh, which specializes in kidnapping teenage girls. You have similar phenomena arising in Central African Republic and Mali. And so the Wagner group out of Russia was invited in to handle that. The downside, of course, is that they oftentimes get paid with mineral concessions. They wind up uh, pillaging and plundering the mineral resources of many of these African countries. And to a certain extent, it can be seen as a logical extension of the collapse of the Soviet Union, which tried to establish a socialist society, that is to say, a con- an economy that's controlled fundamentally by the government, and that did not take flight, shall we say, after 75 years. And so now the, Russia is embarking on the road of capitalism. If you look at the history of capitalism, you look, for example, at the British East India Company, which has been described as Exxon with guns. <laughs> and Exxon with guns is the kind of descriptor of the Wagner group. But that is an aspect of the evolution of capitalism. So, I mean, yeah, but like you said, with guns, um, we, we see so much chaos right now, like, for example, in Niger. Um, and some have suggested I had a guy on my show who's from that that country who was celebrating uh, the fall of, you know, the the coup there because it would chase out the French. Uh, and then I had another expert say, yeah, but then what? Uh, you, you Then you have groups like the Wagner Group who can move in there and, um, you know, be like a shadow government of sorts and, and, and may, you know, ha- not have to follow any international rules of conduct to the extent that, you know, these colonizers do. Well, a good deal of what used to be called French West Africa is decomposing. It's unclear what's going to emerge on the other side, but it's fair to say that French neocolonialism is on its deathbed. I don't know if we've talked about 
recent events in Gabon, the oil-rich country of about three no, million. No, we haven't. Where their leader, Ali Bongo Ndimbo, was just deposed by a coup. He sought to cultivate relations, interestingly enough, with uh, Michael Jackson, with James Brown. Samuel L. Jackson, the actor, carries a Gabonese passport. But he and his father were in power for about 56 years. And they were involved in corruption, needless to say. And then that becomes the staging ground for these military coups. As I said, it's unclear what's going to come afterwards. I mean, for example, in Niger, where you said your guest was celebrating the collapse of the civilian regime, the new regime has just sought to raise the price deeply of their major export, which is uranium. On the one hand, that'll provide more income in Niger. Either it'll go for education and healthcare or it'll go into the pockets of generals. But on the other hand, it's going to cause unrest and unease in France where they're dependent upon that uranium to power nuclear plants that provide electricity. So as I said, so we're, to use your previous phrase, uh, sailing into uncharted water. Let's go to Morris calling us from Inglewood. Morris, you are on with Dr. Gerald Horn. Welcome. Good morning to everyone within the sound of my voice. I have a compound question for you, Dr. Horn. Number one, have you and your literature been banned in uh, Florida? And who is responsible for enforcing the 14th Amendment in this country? And thank you, Dominic. Mm, okay. Yeah, if it hasn't been banned yet, <laughs> Dr. Horn. Well, with regard to the latter, the that's an intriguing question. In the Colorado suit, the litigants, those who are bringing this case, are going to have a major hurdle to overcome because one would think that in order to sue to bar Donald Trump from the ballot in Colorado on 14th Amendment grounds, uh, you should be a person who's competing for the office that Donald Trump wants, which is to say that you would have standing if you're Joseph Biden. But that'll be something for the courts to, to sort out. Also, the lawyers have quarreled about whether the, that 14th Amendment prohibition is self-executing. That is to say, uh, does it require enabling legislation by Congress in order to be oh, effective? Oh, I see. That's another question. So if, if um, this group in Colorado, which is basically a, an advocacy group, if they don't have standing, who would? You said Biden. What about Congress? We know they'll never act, but one would hope they would, it's, but they won't. Well, possibly. I guess Congress, or at least Democrats in co Congress, can make an argument that they would be injured by a Trump victory when he should not be on the ballot. But once again, we're arguing fine points of the law when we all know that the federal courts, at least, are dominated by Trump appointees. And so uh, that might be the end of the story. Yeah, it's a great point. And if it goes to the Supreme Court, as they're saying, the Colorado case likely will, we know that will be the end of the story. It certainly will be. And once again, the, 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 Colorado, I don't think, will be the only uh, litigation. I'm not sure if Mr. Biden would want to sue to bar Mr. Trump from the ballot. He's all, he's already getting a lot of flack for these Jack Smith prosecutions. Yeah. Uh, Trump forces are saying uh, this is not worthy of the United States seeking to lock up your political opponent. And so I'm not sure if Mr. Trump would seek to bar him from the ballot because of that kind of reasoning. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, do you think that Hunter Biden would even be having a special uh, counsel if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, they're trying to balance, supposedly balance out the DOJ Trump investigations? Oh, sure. And of course, raising Hunter Biden uh, automatically causes us to reflect on Jared Kushner, on Donald Trump Jr., on Eric Trump, who've been making out like bandits in recent years particularly Jared Kushner, who got a $2 billion kitty from Gulf Arab states to play with, with the returns we're still waiting for. Boy, I, I don't know how you keep up with it. I, I, I feel like I'm not doing a good job of keeping up with it. Um, when massive major stories get ignored every day, important things, um, and I and I want to and I'm glad you uh, reminded me because I really do want to talk about 
Takia Young. Um, this is a woman who was accused of shoplifting by a an employee inside of a Kroger's uh, or in a Kroger's parking lot. Happened to be some cops out there doing something or other. This employee pointed out this woman saying she had stolen some liquor. And within a minute, she was dead. This is all too typical uh, in this country. I think she was pregnant, too, yes. if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And the child is which means, also dead. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, this is a double tragedy. I'm afraid to say that if you can stomach it, you may be able to find the video online. The, that's the bad news in a sense, because I think we're being numbed by the flood of videos of black people being killed. I think it's desensitizing. On the other hand, for the, a lawyer who would like to bring a wrongful death lawsuit, it's like manna from heaven, because you have this video that shows that either A, the officers of the law were not trained properly to deal with this sort of situation, or B, they were trained properly, but they violated department guidelines. Yeah, um, it's... It's just so sad when you say, you know, it's becoming normalized. I have trouble watching these videos. It's not normal to me. I feel traumatized when I watch them. But I do think we pay a huge price for it in the fact that other people are numb to it, right? We probably wouldn't have another George Floyd because by now, so many of the general population that are not black have become used to it. Not only that. I think that the non-black community has to wake up to the fact that, A, these multi-million dollar judgments mean that you pay more taxes yeah. in order to fund these judgments. And B, I think it's inevitable that uh, when black people are treated like uh, cattle and sheep and dogs, that that bleeds over to how other communities could be treated. Now, to be sure... They may not be treated as harshly as the Kia Young or George Floyd, but inevitably there's going to be an impact, and that's what folks need to realize. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I would like to see, I mean, I, this is one of those cases where before we even knew about the story um, nationally, there was already a lot of disparaging of her and her character, saying she was a teen mom, which she was. She had two other children who now don't have a mom. Um, and saying that she had some, you know, kind of record for small, you know, misdemeanors or whatever. It's this thing that they that law enforcement does where they smear the victim. And these are th these are details that those officers did not know when they chose to take the life of this pregnant woman um, for shoplifting, allegedly. Um, I wish we could have a law that you cannot disparage and smear the victims of police shootings because they're always saying, well, we can't talk about this case because it's, you know, there's an ongoing investigation, but they have plenty of time to tell you that Mike Brown took cigars or, you know, Takia Young uh, had, had misdemeanors. Well, I mean, to the best of my knowledge and understanding, it's not against the law to be a teenage mother. So I'm not even sure what the relevance of that is, other than to seek to call into question the character of a dead young black woman. Likewise, with regard to Michael Brown, the slain teenager in Ferguson, Missouri, when he was shot, there was no knowledge of the man who was pulling the trigger about what his background was or is. It's only that he supposedly was intimidated by the fact that this young black man was upside, and therefore he freaked out and killed him. Mm. Um, wow, we've got, uh, uh, it, it just, it just hurts my heart. I want to talk to you about Cop City. We haven't had a chance to talk about that uh, in a while. I want to get your thoughts on that. The, not just the, the protest against it, but how they're going after those protesters uh, there and um, you know this mysterious story about what Russia is doing with Cuban 
recruits uh, and Elon Musk's personal interference in the war in Ukraine. Like, are these billionaires now little, are they little emperors and kings? And and what can be done about that? It seems like it should be against the law. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this after news, traffic, and sports on KBLA Talk 1580. More of First Things First with Dominique DePrima when we come forward. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. In Georgia, some protesters against Atlanta's controversial, sprawling public safety training center are facing new criminal charges. Five people were arrested yesterday for trespassing and obstruction after chaining themselves to a bulldozer at the construction site in unincorporated DeKalb County. Dozens of activists were indicted last week on racketeering charges for their actions against the planned center, which they call Cop City. A federal appeal this court is putting a hold on a judge's order requiring Texas Governor Greg Abbott to remove a floating barrier from the Rio Grande River. The barrier was installed to stop illegal migrant crossings. A three-judge panel issued the order just the day after a lower court judge ordered the barrier to be removed by September 15th. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Come to Dodger Stadium on September 19th when the boys in blue take on the Tigers for Dia de los Dodgers, presented by Hornitos. Purchase a special ticket pack to receive an exclusive jersey. For tickets and more information, visit Dodgers.com slash ticket pack. This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. I'm a bad man. Serena Williams was 17 when she won her first U.S. Open championship in 1999. Coco Gauff is 19. She's one victory away from following in her idol's footsteps as a rising teenager. Coco defeated Carolina Machova of the Czech Republic in straight sets to advance to Saturday's title match. Coco will play Arina Sabalenka of Belarus. The Dodgers get a shutout win last night in Miami. Mookie Betts was on crutches after the game. He fouled a pitch off his left foot in the second inning. Six weeks ago, Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert was the NFL's highest paid player with an average salary of $52.5 million. That title now belongs to Cincinnati Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow. Burrow signed a five-year deal worth $275 million, an average of $55 million per year. No debates, no speculation. Just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. This is KBLA Talk 1580. Talk radio. That's music to your ears. ears. We're unapologetically progressive. progressive. KBLA Talk 1580. Now. We tend not to think about now. We dream about tomorrow, relive yesterday. But right now in front of us is victory over cancer. Right now, cancer research funded by the V Foundation is leading to better treatments and saving lives. Victory over cancer is there for the taking by you. Because today's cancer research is tomorrow's victory. Learn more at V.org. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. The Black Hollywood Education and Resource Center proudly presents its 25th annual Real Black Men Short Film Showcase, September 22nd through September 24th. Join us for the opening night celebration on Friday, September 22nd, and enjoy the short film showcase featuring 47 films by emerging black male directors from across the country. Continuing on Saturday, September 23rd, and Sunday, September 24th. All events will be held at the Regal LA Live Cinemas, 1000 West Olympic Boulevard in downtown Los Angeles. For more information and tickets, visit BHERC.org. That's BHERC.org or call 323-957-4656. That's 323-957-4656. Don't miss your chance to celebrate excellence in black cinema all weekend long at the Real Black Men Short Film Showcase. See you there.
Are you a small business owner? If so, you know that taxes can be a daunting task. But don't worry, you're not alone. At Wealth Management Financial Advisors, they specialize in helping small businesses with their taxes. They have the experience and expertise to help you file your taxes correctly and on time so you can focus on growing your business. They also offer a variety of tax planning services to help you save money on your taxes. Visit their website or call them today to learn more at wealthmanagementlb.com or 562-427-8877, 562-427-8877, or wealthmanagementlb.com. Hey, this is Zoe Williams, the voice of reason from KBLA Talk 1580. Listen, if you're in the market for the best prices and the fastest delivery for custom-made roller shades, LA Custom Blinds is the place to be. Schedule a free estimate, and they will come to your house, measure your windows, and bring a variety of fabrics to choose from, and then come back and install it all for free. The best part is that their factory is located right here in downtown Los Angeles. So they make the shades really fast. All you got to do is go to LACustomBlinds.com and schedule your free in-home estimate right now. Tell them Zoe Williams sent you. KBLA Talk 1580. I'm Dominique DePrima, and there are so many reasons to take out a small business loan. Set yourself up for long-term success with access to credit for operating expenses, equipment, and technology leasing or financing, and more. Although the process may seem daunting, your U.S. Bank Business Access Advisor can guide you through that process. Whatever your financial goals, U.S. Bank Access Commitment can help support you in reaching them. Access your financial goals at usbank.com slash access member fdic equal housing lender my ride smells just right just right just right just right y'all gotta try that for breeze car just right just right just right just right la 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 with up to 40 days of consistency all over breeze car clips right on your bed you know my car is my happy place keep a smile on my face Find a righteous range and don't be afraid to say what you see. We're KBLA Talk 1580. Uh, Dr. Gerald Horn is my guest. I did what they always tell you not to do. Don't tease 500 things. Just tease one thing. But there's so many, so many points I wanted to uh, just clarify with you. Let's start with Cop City because I want to make sure we don't run out of time. Uh, it's such a scary, scary thing um, as far as the idea of these sort of militarized police training and staging centers. And they're trying to set this, they're trying to build this one in, in a black community in Georgia, but it seems like it could be a bit of a, you know, a pilot for more of the same. More of the same, indeed. And so what's happened is that the State of Georgia, as opposed to the Atlanta prosecutor, Bonnie Willis, has brought this weak RICO indictment against those who have been protesting Cop City. RICO indictment meaning a sprawling indictment charging conspiracy that could lead to lengthy prison terms for these protesters. To complicate matters even further, even though Cop City, as it is called, is designed supposedly to train more police uh, with various methods, over the horizon, I'm afraid to say, is something even more disturbing. You may recall the Hollywood movie of a few years ago, RoboCop? Yeah. Well, with the advance of self-driving taxis in San Francisco due north, with the proliferation of drone warfare on the battlefield of Ukraine and Russia, that is to say, a pilotless aircraft, for example, it's only a short step to imagine that robot cops are on the way. And in fact, in New York, as you know, there was an attempt to have these robot police dogs. The problem there here too is that oh, in Los Angeles too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the problem there, we've already made reference to the fact about how these police officers don't seem to have a conscience when it comes to dealing with black people. Well, by definition, a robot doesn't have conscious consciousness or a conscience. And we already know about, in terms of artificial intelligence, how there is difficulty in distinguishing black faces or when artificial intelligence spots a dark-skinned face, they automatically uh, default to seeing a dark-skinned face as a thief or a terrorist. 
So uh, this is a brave new world, I'm afraid to say, that we're about to enter. You know, it's funny, Dr. Dr. Joe Horn, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but to me that the AI overlords are just not ready. I think the, the, it's overly hyped in the sense that, yeah, the robot dog was approved for here, actually. I think it's just one of them that was donated, but I'm sure it'll lead to more. They lied and said they, LAP lied, PD, PD lied and said they weren't using drones, and they are. Um, but they they make so many mistakes. You've seen these. I, I even saw when I was in San Francisco, these driverless cars just stopping, and then traffic is backed up for miles. You know, like you said, the AI can't distinguish black faces or Latino faces. Yes, it it leads to profiling and probably even death, but actual robocops and driverless cop cars, I just, I don't think that technology is ready. Well, uh, I agree. But as you walk the streets of San Francisco, <laughs> you see that they're there. Yeah, and they are there. <laughs> And you might have seen the scene of this uh, uh, driverless taxi. Uh, it, it gets trapped in concrete, for example. It wasn't able to evade a cement mixer and got stuck, for example. Now, of course, those who uh, try to perfect the technology say, well, yeah, accidents do happen, but we can perfect the technology. And so let's move on. Nothing to see here. Yeah. 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 Well, and you know, that, that's a great example. And a friend told me that if, that if you put a cone, you know, those traffic, orange traffic cones on top of one of those um, driverless cars, it will stop because it gets confused and does not know how to handle a traffic cone on the hood. I mean, and I can imagine the implications for a robo cop, you know, but Nevertheless, uh, the the RICO situation is troubling because it seems like the trend towards criminalization of protesters, especially when they do the false equivalency of, you know, the January 6th attempted coup uh, folks being the same as Black Lives Matter protesters, that it seems to provide an excuse for draconian and excessive sentences. It's not only that, uh, as I'm sure you know, a number of Republicans with regard to January 6, 2021, their contention to this very day is that those folks were basically tourists uh, out for a morning stroll. Any violence that was inflicted was done by left-wingers and people, for example. So the problem we face, amongst others, is this refusal to accept the truth aligned with the spreading of misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, b uh, back to Fulton County for a minute. I just saw this report that according to uh, the grand jury report that came out today, they recommended charges against Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, and former Senators David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler. Um, that means, I guess, that D.A. Fannie Willis uh, decided not to bring those charges. Who's bringing those charges? Against those charges? Well, it's just saying that the special grand jury in Fulton County recommended charges. This is from CNN oh, I see. against Lindsey Graham, uh, David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler. But Fannie Willis chose not to charge. Now, can you imagine oh, if she had charged those uh, Republican senators uh, in this... <laughs> Even though they, I would, I would argue they deserved uh, charges as well. Especially Lindsey Graham, he was over there trying to meddle the whole time. Well, sure, I, I think it would be quite worthwhile to bring an indictment against Lindsey Graham. If anything, it would force him to expend his campaign funds in terms of hiring <laughs> a team of lawyers. So, if nothing else, that would be a good reason to to indict him. But. I'm surprised by the restraint shown by attorney Bonnie Willis because she has been not known for restraint. So I guess I need to rethink. Yeah, it is interesting. I, but those special grand juries I'm reading here, they can't bring indictments, so they can only recommend it. And if the DA doesn't do it, then it goes away. Is that is that right, Dr. Horn? More or less. Yeah. 
So uh, don't look for charges, <laughs> no matter how much we would like to see them. Don't look for charges uh, on, on uh, Lindsey Graham. Okay, so Cuba is saying that some of its citizens were lured or tricked uh, into becoming soldiers in Ukraine. Um, they're trying to um, start criminal proceedings against what they're calling a human trafficking network. I know Russia seems to be desperate for, you know, soldiers, for people power um, in this Ukraine war. What do you make of this story? Well, I think it's also a reflection of the desperate economic situation uh, in Cuba. The fact that young men in particular feel that they have to risk death on the battlefield of Ukraine in order to try to put some money in their pockets. But it also ties in to this other story you wanted to raise about Elon Musk and this Starlink satellite system that he uses to help the Ukrainians. And supposedly he withdrew it at a critical moment because of fear of the Russian response. But if you step back for a moment, I think you can draw a connection between this Elon Musk story, the Russia recruiting story, and the Wagner Group, because what's happened in recent years, in recent decades, has been a weakening of government and an empowering of private individuals like Mr. Prigozhin, the late Mr. Prigozhin, uh, who had, in effect, an army under his thumb, and Elon Musk. In fact, Ronan Farrell, you recall him, he's yes. the son of Mia Farrell, he did a real intriguing story in the New Yorker on Elon Musk, where folks in the Pentagon are quite wary about this trend because they feel that Elon Musk has more influence and authority over certain U.S. military strategies than the Pentagon does because of his control of Starlink and mm. his ability to send satellites into outer space. Ultimately, I think we're going to have to rethink that whole process that led to this sad state of affairs. I mean, he, he did walk it back on Twitter. I guess he's saying that he was try he didn't want um, SpaceX to be explicitly complicit in a major act of war and conflict ex escalation. So he just he's saying he didn't disable it. He just didn't follow the request of the Ukrainian government. But it is I mean, it is really for me scary to think about how one individual billionaire has the power of or more power than certain government agencies or entire uh, entire nations. We're talking with Dr. Gerald Horn, continuing the conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. She's reclaiming her time on KBLA Talk 1580. More First Things First with Dominic DePrima when we come forward. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Maisha Cairo here with a quick recap for my time at J.P. Morgan Chase's Advancing Black Wealth Tour. There were speakers Ian Dunlap, Damon John, Lynn Richardson, MC Light, Don Kennedy, to name a few. Take a listen to what Justin Grant, Community Development Lead at Chase's Advancing Black Pathway, let's see what he had to say. So I'm Justin Grant. I lead Community Development and National Partnerships for J.P. Morgan Chase's Advancing Black Pathway strategy and so we're focused on strengthening the economic foundation of black communities and we're making targeted investments in programs like the advancing black wealth tour to help us get our tools and resources out to the community to drive sustained impact over time so when it comes to black and brown people it sounds like chase is making it their personal responsibility not only to facilitate these events but to educate and provide resources so mr grant i have to ask what does wealth building look like for the individual it's home ownership. It's having that freedom to be able to start your own business and create jobs in your community. And it's having that long-term plan towards retirement, having that vision for what you want your life to be, and you have the resources to actually live it. I'm Aisha Cairo. Thanks for sticking around. That was my recap from Chase's Advancing Black Wealth Tour. First stop was here in L.A., and they're taking it national. When you're young, life is full of choices. Don't let opioids like highly addictive and deadly fentanyl take away your life with just one wrong pill. Addiction is a disease that can affect anyone at any age. 
but there is a choice to get help for this disease. Find medically proven treatment options, including virtual, at choosemat.org. One in four Americans today are living with a disability. I'm one of them. People with disabilities are extremely talented, resilient problem solvers that have so much to offer. And we've got a trusted ally on our side, an organization we can rely on, Easter Seals. Easter Seals is leading the way to full equity, inclusion, and access to health care, employment, and education for people with disabilities, families, and communities. That's my Easter Seals. Make it yours. Learn more and get involved at EasterSeals.com. We're not for everybody, but we're for everybody. You're listening to KBLA Talk 1580. Dr. Gerald Horn is my guest, and you can find his new books or books uh, focused on him, I should say, out right now, I dare say, um, out this moment. No, that's coming out later this week, right? Um, and then, And then Acknowledging Radical Histories, Conversations with Dr. Gerald Horn. That one is out right now. Both of them are compilations, anthologies of the work of Dr. Gerald Horn, as you said, uh, maybe <laughs> Cliff's Notes in some cases for uh, for some of your books. Looking forward to getting my hands on those. And you can find them on the Internet, so you can also find them at a black bookstore near you. Dr. Horn, I haven't had a chance to dive into this yet, but I'm, I'm uh, curious to get your take as you brought it to my attention, the fact that the L.A. City Council is on the front page of the New York Times today. How a new city council map of L.A. turned into a political bra- brawl. Blatant political gerrymandering occurring in cities across the country, many of them run by Democrats in Los Angeles. A scandal over a racist recording was only the tip of the iceberg. Well, yes, it's a, it's a huge story, and I recommend it to the L.A. audience in particular. And they contextualize that <clears throat> racist recording involving a city councilman, Kevin de Leon, which we know so much about, but it was in the context of sitting city council persons seeking to either preserve their existing districts or cannibalize the districts of presumed political opponents and or gerrymander, that is to say, reconfigure uh, districts of presumed political opponents. I should also Uh, make a footnote with regard to our previous discussion with regard to these driverless cars and this artificial intelligence, obviously that jeopardizes the future of Uber and Lyft drivers. The fact that already, or not to mention taxi drivers, already you have these driverless cars. And so what is that going to mean in, in terms of unemployment compensation, for example? What is that going to mean in terms of the livelihoods of these drivers who are basically thrown into the streets? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, um, and it's one we're going to be dealing with more and more. I was just reading how the IRS is looking at using AI now. Everyone's using AI. Um, so I guess that is the argument, one of the arguments for universal basic income. If there's no jobs for any of us and we get to, you know, write our great American novel, then how are we going to support ourselves? Well, not only that, but as you know, newspapers increasingly are moving towards using artificial intelligence to write stories about city council meetings, about baseball games. And I was seeing examples of what some of these AI contraptions were doing in terms of journalism. And I have to say, it wasn't bad. (laughs) You know what? It's passable. You say that, but if you got one of those papers turned into your, you know, by one of your students, you would know. I mean, my... My 18-year-old uh, can spot AI-generated articles. In fact, it's become sort of a sport with him and his friends, you know, um, picking out and, and making fun of the AI-written pieces. Well, of course. And students are using AI to turn in papers, for example. There was an article in the New York Times the other day about the personal essay with the wrecking of affirmative action admissions officers at universities and colleges are going to be looking more at personal essays. And now high school seniors are using AI to craft and or polish their personal essays. And not to mention the writers on the streets of Los Angeles on strike, the screenwriters who are worried that AI will be used to write television 
dramas and to write movie scenarios. Yeah. Uh, this is all in motion. I mean, they can copy my voice. The, you know, Ice Cube has already put it, let it be known that anybody copying him, his voice or his style using AI will be sued and have the book thrown at them. But not all of us have the, <laughs> the means to do that. Well, that's for sure. And what actors are worried about now is how their images and their voices will be stolen yep. and replicated and they won't be compensated. That's in motion as we speak. Yeah, in fact, I, I understand it's already happening like in certain situations where um, they couldn't finish a shoot or whatever. They bring in AI because they don't want to bring the actor back. Um, the G20, we, we just have a few minutes here, but it's important. G20 is in India. Why does that matter? When it matters, the U.S. President, uh, Joseph R. Biden, flew all the way across the world to India. He'll sort of have the stage to himself because Vladimir Putin is not coming to this meeting of leading nations. Uh, President Xi is not coming to this meeting of leading nations. Of course, there are conflicts and contradictions between India and China that are difficult to smooth over move over. But what I find interesting about this trip that after India, Mr. Biden will be flying to Vietnam and U.S. relations with Vietnam are getting ever closer because both countries, the United States and Vietnam, are apprehensive about the rise of China, which is obviously calls into question why 50,000 U.S. citizens were killed fighting a war in Vietnam some decades ago, supposedly because of the spread of communism, obviously ignoring the conflict that stretch back millennia between Vietnam and China. Mm, yeah, well, so China's president is is not coming to the G20. Um, and do you think that, you know, like the, we talk about the rise of BRICS and, and different, you know, the different configurations and sort of strange bedfellows that are also coming about because of uh, the war in Ukraine and global economics, do you think that we're, really looking at another new world order, a newer world order? I think it's highly possible. As a matter of fact, I think that with regard to what we started off talking about, the changes in Niger and Gabon, Mali, etc., I think that many of these African nations are coming to recognize that with the rise of the BRICS, they don't necessarily have to go to the World Bank for development loans. Mm. They can go to the BRICS Bank for development loans. The problem is, is this conflict between India and China, which on the surface are partners in the, in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, or to put it another way, CRIB, China, Russia, <laughs> India, Brazil, and South Africa. That actually, that's probably the acronym we should use on these airwaves. But until that relationship is sorted out, uh, I don't think we can begin to talk credibly about a new world order. Yeah. Um, well, it, it's it's a precarious time, right? I mean, even I know it's a bit overhyped, but even the uh, new love, apparent love between um, North Korea and uh, and Russia sort of tips the scales a bit, too, doesn't it? Or could it? Oh, well, sure. It's sort of a marriage of convenience. That is to say yeah. that South Korea uh, has gotten closer to Japan, its age-old antagonist. Uh, this is outraging North Korea, and so it's snuggling ever closer to Russia, which needs the artillery shells that North Korea produces in profusion. So, once again, international relations are not static. It's fluid. It's changing almost to the day, which is one of the reasons why we value so highly KBLA. Well, we value you, Dr. Gerald Horn. Uh, tell us, you know, tell us how to keep up with what you're doing. Well, you mentioned one aspect, which is YouTube. Uh, we're uploading a video to YouTube about two or three times a week. And otherwise, of course, we're uploading videos to Facebook as well. And also uh, announcements about uh, upcoming speaking engagements and the like. And finding you on Facebook is just your name, right? Gerald Horn. Correct. 
Dr. Gerald Horn. And um, I can't wait to take a look at these uh, these two anthologies on your life. I dare say, um, as you say, young scholars who are highlighting, I guess, what they what they've been inspired by in your work, Acknowledging Radical Histories, Conversations with Dr. Gerald Horn is out now. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining me on a Friday. It's always great to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. The best of Tavis Smiley is coming up next. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Don't forget to tussle with me on the social medias, KBLA 1580, wherever you hang out on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. If you missed my conversation with the mayor of Los Angeles on yesterday, find it on the KBLA app or wherever you get your podcast. I'm Dominique DePrima. History is now, and we're making it together until Monday. One love. KBLA 1580 Santa Monica. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. In Georgia, some protesters against Atlanta's controversial sprawling public safety training center are facing new criminal charges. Five people were arrested yesterday for trespassing and obstruction after chaining themselves to a bulldozer at the construction site in unincorporated DeKalb County. Dozens of activists were indicted last week on racketeering charges for their actions against the planned center, which they call Cop City. A federal appeals court is putting a hold on a judge's order requiring Texas Governor Greg Abbott to remove a floating barrier from the Rio Grande River. The barrier was installed to stop illegal migrant crossings. A three-judge panel issued the order just a day after a lower court judge ordered the barrier to be removed by September 15th. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Come to Dodger Stadium on September 19th when the boys in blue take on the Tigers for Dia de los Dodgers, presented by Hornitos. Purchase a special ticket pack to receive an exclusive jersey. For tickets and more information, visit Dodgers.com slash ticket pack. Is this, the this is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. I'm a bad man. Serena Williams was 17 when she won her first U.S. Open championship in 1999. Coco Gauff is 19. She's one victory away from following in her idol's footsteps as as a rising teenager, Coco defeated Carolina Muchova of the Czech Republic in straight sets to advance to Saturday's title match. Coco will play Arina Sabalenka of Belarus. The Dodgers get a shutout win last night in Miami. Mookie Betts was on crutches after the game. He fouled a pitch off his left foot in the second inning. Six weeks ago, Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert was the NFL's highest paid player with an average salary of $52.5 million. That title now belongs to Cincinnati Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow. Burrow signed a five-year deal worth $275 million, an average of $55 million per year. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KB. BLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580 is dedicated to empowering our communities by providing progressive talk radio for our audience. We strive to be an intersectional voice for the voiceless. As a black-owned and operated station, we are committed to highlighting diverse perspectives and creating safe spaces for meaningful dialogue. We believe that everyone has something unique to bring to these political, economic, social, and cultural conversations. And we don't shy away from the hard conversations about current events. We endeavor to be a beacon of hope and understanding while boldly challenging listeners to think more deeply about difficult topics that impact us all. With this in mind, our mission statement at KBLA Talk 1580 is simple. To create an inclusive platform that promotes civil discourse through honest dialogue and encourages personal growth among our listeners so they can become the active agents of change. Our vision is to establish ourselves as the premier radio network with relevant programming across the beloved community, connecting people through shared experiences and collective power for lasting impact beyond these challenging times. Time now for the best of Tavis Smiley on KBLA Talk 1580. One, two, three, go!
Live from the Mert Park, USA, I'm Tavis Smiley, and you're listening to the best of Tavis Smiley on KBLA Talk 1580. Let me invite you to follow us on all of our socials at KBLA 1580. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, all at KBLA 1580. You can also download our app at KBLA 1580. Take us with you anywhere in the world and listen to us in real time by downloading our app at KBLA 1580. Should you miss us any day in real time, check out the podcast of this program by going to the app, the website, Anchor, or Spotify, and now Apple Podcast as well. Check out our podcast at your leisure should you miss us any day in real time. Let me also invite you to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at the Real Tavis Smiley and get Twitter updates at Tavis Smiley. A good Best of Tavis Smiley show on tap for you today. In our second hour today, you are in for a treat. Two great artists. We'll start with acclaimed R&B superstar Maxwell ahead of his performances this weekend at the famed Hollywood Bowl here in Southern California. We'll also talk about his upcoming and inaugural Urban Hang Suite cruise aboard the Norwegian Pearl. Maxwell at the top of hour two on the B side of hour two. Old Soul is the title track on the new project from eight-time Grammy winner and second son of Bob Marley, Stephen Marley, who joins us to talk about his first new album in over seven years. In our third hour today, Punished for Dreaming, How School Reform Harms Black Children and How We Heal, an insightful conversation with Dr. Bettina L. Love of Columbia. All that said, we commence today's program in dialogue with one of the nation's most distinguished journalists, Samuel G. Friedman. He joins us now for historical reexamination of Hubert Humphrey and one of the most overlooked landmarks in all of civil rights history. Sammy, how are you today, sir? I'm doing well, Tavis, and it's a complete honor to be on your show again, and I always learn something from the time that I spend with you, so it's very reciprocal. You are kind. You are kind. I'm I'm glad we have another hour in our lives to spend some time together. Uh, hopefully learning from each other. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm going to learn from you in this hour. Let, let, let me start with this. Um, and I, I want the audience to hear the story about uh, a man who history has regarded, frankly, as a loser. I think it's fair to say that mm-hmm. Hubert Humphrey has been regarded as a loser uh, by American history. And you bring us a different way uh, um, into looking at what Hubert Humphrey accomplished, specifically on the issue of civil rights, which is vitally important uh, to my uh, and to this audience. But I want to start with this, uh, a broad question. I'm, I'm, the New York Times says of your book that it is riveting, a superbly written tale of moral and political courage for present day readers who find themselves in similarly dark times. A superbly written tale of moral and political courage for present day readers who find themselves in similarly dark times. I don't know what readers uh, what readers, which readers uh, the Times was speaking of, but no matter who they're talking about, <laughs> we are living in some dark times. Mm-hmm. So all readers in this society uh, must acknowledge that these are some dark times for our democracy. And I, I wanted to start with a couple of broad questions about how you read these dark times that we are in, number one. And then I want to probe this notion of what you've learned about moral and political courage. Let's start, though, first with these dark times. Absolutely, Tavis. Well, the battle that Hubert Humphrey and his allies were involved in in the 1940s, which is the decade I mostly focus on Mm -hmm. in the book, is really the same battle we have now. And it's a battle of interracial, interfaith, inclusive democracy against different forms of autocracy. And the terms that were used by the uh, autocrats in Humphrey's time are the same ones we hear now. Christian nationalism, white supremacist, America firstism. Mm. And so when Humphrey 
and the people who were on his side in this, people like the great labor and civil rights leader, A. Philip Randolph, mm -hmm. and Walter White, the executive secretary of the NAACP, and Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady who was far more progressive on civil rights than her husband, FDR, ever was. The, the battle that they were involved in, in the near term, was about things like desegregating the armed forces, getting a fair employment law, trying to put an end to lynching. Some of these battles we know took 50 or 60 more years to be won. Mm -hmm. But those were part of a broader effort to push back against segregationists like Strom Thurmond, um, America First people like this right-wing preacher Gerald L.K. Smith and, and Father Coughlin, and people whose view of America is that it was just a place for white Protestants, mm. that if you were a black or a Jew or a Catholic, you didn't belong. And this is another thing that's sadly true of some of the Trump era. The right-wingers of that era, like Trump, would say, we want to have a social safety net, but only for the people who we consider the true Americans. Mm -hmm. Everyone else, and this was literally being said in Humphrey's time, blacks, you should be sent back to Africa. Jews, you should be interned. Catholics, you can be allowed to exist as a kind of a second class of, uh, of Christians. And so the fact that we're fighting the same battle now doesn't mean that Humphrey and Randolph and Walter White and Eleanor Roosevelt and their allies lost. It means that what we learned from history, and it goes back to, you know, the rollback against Reconstruction, is that every time we have progress, especially on racial equality, that it means we're going to be met with backlash and we can never assume the fight's over. Mm. And why do you think that is? Why are we always met with backlash when we take two steps forward? Well, what is it that Frederick Douglass said about power never surrendering without a struggle? Oh, yeah. So if you, ha if you have a country in which a lot of its population defines it as this is a country for white Protestants, and they are challenged, they're challenged by the emancipation of African Americans, they're challenged by massive Jewish and Catholic immigration between 1880 and 1924, they're challenged by the coming of Asian American and Hispanic and Caribbean-based immigrants, and they're challenged by moments when the government becomes more progressive, whether it's in passing Reconstruction in the 1860s and 70s, or whether it's passing the civil rights laws of the 1960s, there's a pushback. Mm. There's a an anxiety of losing power and losing status and losing your ability to define who gets to belong, mm. you know. And so, you know, it's no surprise to me, sadly, that the battles we're in now come right on the heels mm. of two terms of Barack Obama being president, you know, marriage equality being enacted by the Supreme Court. Um, these are threats to a certain kind of, it, of person. No, it raises fundamental questions. Uh, there are a few of them that are running through my head right now. One of them is whether or not, uh, to your earlier point, multiracial democracy is even possible. That's just one of the few things running through my head. We'll uh, get Samuel uh, Friedman's response to that and a great deal more. We're just getting started in this hour, talking about moral and political courage in dark times. You're listening to Tavis Smiley. For all the freedom-loving folk, this is Tavis Smiley. I feel like free. This is the intro to the all electric Cadillac perfected like Zoom. And on a full charge, you get 450 miles without a stop haiku. This is what I do. Daddy fat in the lag since 92. Make all the way back panoramic roof. Come with 24 inch rim standard. Ooh, why? Shot it, don't kill him. Cadillac diamond in the back, cold chilling. And when I'm on attack, on the track, is no ceiling. Sky's the limit. Give me, give me. Scrape drop, no parachutes. Lay lines like a longitude and latitude. Feel it, beloved. Clearly, we're hustling. Bus, trucking. Cadillac. For more on the Escalade IQ, visit Cadillac.com. Available late 2024, GMS to 450 mile range. On a full charge based on development testing and or analytical projection. Consistent with the CHA 1634 revision 2017 MCT. Range subject to change prior to production. Annual rates may vary based on service factors, including ambience, temperature, terrain, battery age, and condition loading. And how you use and maintain your vehicle. What does access mean? Access means owning a home. Access means growing my business. 
Access means building generational wealth. No matter your goals, U.S. Bank Access Commitment Programs and initiatives provide the tools and resources to help you reach them. Access your financial goals at usbank.com slash access. Member FDIC Equal Housing Lender. Extended Family Outreach Ministry presents Praise Fest 2023, Worthy to be Praised Conference and Concert, September 23rd, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Redondo Beach Performing Arts Center. Morning worship, keynote address, and conference featuring women in creative arts ministry and leadership sharing our stories, His glory, giving all praise, honor, thanksgiving, and glory to God. Don't miss the afternoon Stand Up and Sing Praises concert with the Katinas, gospel singer Babby Mason, Three Daughters, and Kevin Click. That's Praise Fest 2023. 23 Worthy to be Praised Conference and Concert, September 23rd, Redondo Beach Performing Arts Center. For more information and tickets, go to PraiseFest2023 at eventbrite.com. Plus, for the next 48 hours, use promo code KBLA48 to get your tickets free. You do not want to miss this day of praise. That's PraiseFest2023 at eventbrite.com. Let's get back to more of Tavis Smiley right now. Just getting started really in this hour talking about what um, A. Philip Randolph and Eleanor Roosevelt and Walter White and uh, Hubert Humphrey were up against then and what we are up against now. There were dark times then. We are living through and in dark times right about now. I haven't even gotten yet to the kind of moral and political courage that's needed uh, in a moment like this where our democracy is on the precipice. But um, uh, our guest is Samuel Friedman, as I mentioned. His book is called Into the Bright Sunshine, Young Hubert Humphrey and the Fight for Civil Rights. Um, history has regarded Humphrey as a loser. No question about that. And leave it to Samuel G. Friedman to give us a different way to look at Humphrey, particularly as it relates to civil rights. I'll get to that as we move through this hour. But let me start with, with this fundamental question, uh, uh, I think pivotal question, but uh, but fundamental nonetheless. Uh, Samuel, and that is whether or not, given what you said already, you believe that multiracial democracy is even possible. We now live in the most multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic America ever. And one could argue that that very reality, that that is the nation that we're living in right now, would suggest that we're doing it. And yet, frankly, I could give you a a number of other examples that suggest that we aren't doing it and that we're not doing it well and that we may never do it well. So I ask you, sir, whether or not you believe that multiracial democracy is possible. I think we have to believe it's possible. If we become pessimistic or cynical or hopeless about it, that's what the right wing extreme wants. They want people like us to be paralyzed by the idea that we can't make progress. But we've had that progress in the very recent past in, you know, in the coalition that was the Obama coalition that elected him twice and, you know, in some ways reconstituted itself to elect Joe Biden um, in 2020. And, of course, the specter of a true multicultural, interracial, interfaith, you know, coalition being in power in this country is deeply terrifying to, you know, white supremacy. It's deeply terrifying to Christian nationalism. And that's why it's not just that we see, you know, the political side of of Trumpism, because it's bigger than Donald Trump. It's the whole Republican Party. It's why you see outlawing teaching black history, Mm -hmm. you know, outlawing taking an AP class in black history in in the state of Florida. Um, the, The fact that knowledge can be passed along and that great black art could be celebrated that's an incredible challenge or that, you know, mm-hmm. books buying about gay people could be in libraries. That's intolerable to people on the other side. And that's why we have to keep mm-hmm. pushing, because if we if we relent, they're not going to stop. They're 24 yeah, seven. But if I, if, if I were going to argue, you're, you're, you're my friend and brother, so I'm not going to argue on this point. But if I were going to argue on this point uh, that we have to believe that multiracial democracy is possible, my exhibit A would be what you just put your finger on. Look at the the, the, the black lash, if you will, or the white lash, if you yes. will, that we got to the election of yeah. Barack Obama. Does that not suggest that multiracial democracy may be impossible in this country? Just that fact toward alone i think it means it's going to be severely contested yeah and it means that we have to keep fighting for it and it also gets to i think a really key point tavis and that 
I think at our best or most optimistic, and maybe we've been too optimistic, there is an idea that you could change the minds of mm-hmm. haters. And I think what we're realizing more realistically is that while some individual minds may be changed, what you have to do is have laws and social norms that at least make the haters keep it private or more underground. Um, one of the things I did in my book is um, I wrote a lot about um, two of Humphrey's most important friends and allies in Minneapolis when he was mayor there, a, a black newspaper publisher who I'd love to talk to, we'll talk about more later, named Cecil Newman, who is just a mm-hmm. magisterial figure in black journalism, and a, a white anti-defamation lawyer named Sam Shiner. And I went back to Sam Shiner's daughter and Cecil Newman's granddaughter, who still publishes his newspaper to this day. And I asked his granddaughter, Trace Williams Dillard, about her reaction to the murder of George Floyd, which took place like six blocks from her office, by the way. And I asked Sam Shiner's daughter, Susan Druskin, what did you think when you were watching the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville? Um on television, and neither of them said they were surprised. Mm. They both said that, you know, their grandfather and father, respectively, had said to them in pretty much the same words, the haters don't go away, they just hide. But what you can hope for is to make the, the legal and social sanctions against them strong enough that they can't exert themselves and feel like they can literally, uh, t- you know, run a coup mm-hmm. like Cario. And the Proud Boys did just, you know, within recent memory. And I think that's the best we can hope for. And Humphrey's example and the example of him working with Randolph, I think, is instructive in a couple of ways. One thing (laughs) is that when my book kind of culminates at the 1948 Democratic Convention, which is when the Democrats fully endorsed civil rights for the first time ever, It's a Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside operation. Mm -hmm. Humphrey's inside the convention hall getting ready to give this spellbinding speech that's going to get the delegates to endorse civil rights, even though Harry Truman doesn't want it to happen, and even though the Southern Dixiecrats are going to walk out. But outside the hall, A. Philip Randolph is leading protest marches every day Mm -hmm. because he was leading a campaign for black draft resistance. He was urging young black Americans, since it was an all-male army at that time, don't register for the draft, don't serve if you're called up, until America desegregates the military. Because how can we brag about how we defeated the fascists, you know, the Nazis, Mm -hmm. and still have a segregated army? And Humphrey and Randolph's aides were exchanging letters after that convention that I read, and each one is saying, we couldn't have done it without you. You needed mass mobilization, and you needed political skill on the inside. And I think that's one yeah. enduring lesson. Either one without the other is not going to make it. No, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me, just, let me start with this. Um, to your point about Humphrey on the inside and Randolph on the outside, you did an inside game, outside game. I, I totally concur, and I, I, I received the point. It's just worth noting, just to put a, foot point, uh, a footnote on that, that after all the the uh, the organizing and protesting that Randolph did, uh, leading uh, ultimately Truman to decide that the uh, military in this country needed to be segregated, as you well know as a brilliant historian and writer, uh, black soldiers on their way back uh, to this country um, from helping to win that war uh, and save the world from fascism had to sit in the back of the train behind Nazi war criminals. Uh, absolutely. Not, 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 it's one thing. It's one thing, Samuel, to have to sit on the back of the train. These Negroes offered themselves up. Um, they uh, um, went and put their lives on the line. Some of them obviously did not come home. Um, uh, thankfully, the Tuskegee Airmen never lost a single plane they escorted. Their record was uh, was perfect. Uh, and yet, when these African soldiers, these African-American soldiers, these black soldiers, Negro soldiers, colored soldiers on their way home, they're not just sitting behind the white boys on the train. They have to sit in the back of the train behind the captured Nazi war criminals, Sam. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, it got worse than that. um, There were a series of violent and often fatal attacks on black war veterans when they came home. And this is part of what inspired Randolph and, and Humphrey to take on the issue of desegregating the military. There was, in the most notorious of these cases, Tavis, a sergeant named Isaac Woodard, 
who was in his uniform and the you know the the rednecks of the South found it intolerable to see a black man in uniform, mm-hmm. and especially a black man who would then register to vote or go, or go in the front door of the restaurant or in Isaac Waters' case, sit in the front of the bus. So he's on this bus going home to South Carolina, and he gets off in a small town to use the bathroom, and the local sheriff confronts him, beats him, and literally gouges his eyes out. Mm. And Isaac Woodward then went on after recovering to speak around the country at civil rights rallies to leverage, you know, his wartime sacrifice and the terrorism inflicted on him on the home front um, on behalf of saying to America, and this was a key question after the war, okay, we defeated fascism. What are we going to do about the hatred at home? And there was an amazing letter I've read in my research between Hubert Humphrey and a guy named John Neumeier. John Neumeier was a young German Jew. He got out of Nazi Germany like at the last minute in the late 1930s, made it to Minneapolis, enlisted in the army. Because he spoke German, he got assigned to be a guard at a prison camp for Nazi uh, POWs out in Nebraska. And he and Humphrey were corresponding. And Neumeier said to Humphrey, who was very upset that he couldn't get into Uh, the military because of deferments, because he had kids and he had a double hernia. And Neumeier said, we don't need you to shoot a gun. We need you to fight the battle here. Neumeier saying, you should hear what the American GIs say about the war. They say that we fought this war because of the blacks. We fought it because of the Jews. We fought it because of the British. So your battle is at home. Mm. And that goes right to the point you were making earlier about, indeed, you know, black soldiers on duty or returning who would sit behind Nazi um, POWs. I've heard stories that Nazi POWs on bases in the South, they'd be taken off to see movies in the movie theaters that wouldn't let black people Mm -hmm. uh, sit in them at all or had to sit way up in the balcony. Mm -hmm. So that revealed so much about the moral gaps in America then. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to get back to this issue that you raised a moment ago. This this is the sweet part of this story. Uh, Hubert Humphrey is just 37 years of age. When he gives this major speech in July 1948, that really does change uh, the narrative on civil rights in this country. I'll let Samuel Friedman unpack that story for you in a moment. But before I get to that, let me stay with this. Uh, we were, were, were talking, uh, you, you were talking, I was talking about, uh, again, these black soldiers having to sit behind with Nazi war criminals. And to your, your point, uh, they were taking these Nazi war criminals to go see movies out of the prison that black Colored folk couldn't get into these theaters. Uh, And I was with I was with uh, my friend Cornell West uh, a couple weeks ago. We were in Mississippi for the annual Emmett Till uh, anniversary celebration Mm -hmm. weekend. So every year in Mississippi, where they, of course, murdered Emmett Till, Mississippi is the state of my birth. um, They they have a week long uh, celebration of, um, of Emmett Till. Uh, uh, just a young man, of course, when he was murdered, but his legacy is um, uh, is indelible. His imprint uh, is indelible on the history of this country and what came from that. Rosa Parks will tell you if she were here, she was thinking about Emmett Till the day she sat down mm. on that on that bus. So um, his legacy um, and the impact of that legacy is, is still to be uh, wrestled with even today. But Dr. West very quickly was, was making this point, and I, I, I've been noodling on it and marinating about it. I'll see him in a couple of days for another event. And I'll talk to him about it when I see him. But I've been thinking about something he said the other day. And I think you'll get this, uh, Samuel. He was talking about the fact that what black folk needed then, since we're talking about then and now, dark times then, dark times now, moral and political courage necessary then, moral and political courage necessary now. What black folk needed then and now, Dr. West argues, are not white allies. Everybody talks about white allies. He makes a distinction, he did, between white allies and a white brother being in the band. <laughs> it, they're, they're two different <laughs> things. It's one thing for you to be an ally. It's another thing for Clarence right. to be in the E Street band with Bruce, with Bruce Springsteen. Clarence <laughs> ain't no ally. The brother is in the band. And uh, Dr. West ran through a number of these sort of analogies, as only Cornell West can, making a distinction about being an ally versus being in the band. And as I'm as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about that because, again, in real time, what black folk need now when it comes to civil rights, and we'll get to the Hubert Humphrey story in a moment, are not just white allies, but folk who are willing, Samuel, to be in the band with us, if that makes sense. It makes total sense to me. And 
you know, although I use the word ally sometimes to describe Humphrey in the way Dr. West frames it, he is much more a part of the band. And I'll give you a couple of examples sure. that really that really speak to that. Number one, very few people know this. When when Hubert Humphrey was as mayor of Minneapolis, taking on the rampant racism and anti Semitism in town and pushing through laws on fair housing and fair employment, he was almost assassinated by a neo Nazi for that reason. Mm-hmm. He came home from, you know, his mayoral business one night in early 1947, and as he was fumbling for his door keys, three bullets whizzed by him. And the person who almost certainly did that shooting was a follower of a right-wing racist group in Georgia called the Columbians Mm -hmm. that were later involved, by the way, in anti-civil rights bombings in Georgia. And he was in contact with them, had their material, had knives and guns in his possession when the police arrested him. Humphrey almost paid with his life. And after that happened, he didn't back down. He kept on pushing. He wasn't dissuaded even by almost being killed for it. And to fast forward, right after his civil rights speech in 1948 and this remarkable vote by the delegates to endorse civil rights for the first time, He gets a telegram from Cecil Newman, the newspaper publisher I mentioned before, congratulating him. When Humphrey writes back to Cecil Newman, he says, this wasn't my victory. This was our victory. Mm -hmm. People like you Mm -hmm. have been fighting this battle all along. You made this possible. So Humphrey understood who he was standing with. He wasn't doing for, he was doing with. Yeah, I love that. Um, When we come forward, um, we've made references to it now two or three times. I want you to hear more detail about how Hubert Humphrey, at just 37 years of age, um, convinces the Democratic Party in July 1948 at the convention in Philadelphia. Um, He convinces, at just 37, um, this party to do the right thing for the first time ever on the issue of civil rights. What did Hubert Humphrey say that day? They got the good white folk to do the right thing. We'll hear that story when we come forward from Samuel G. Friedman on Tavis Smiley. From the Merck Park with love, 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 this love. is Tavis Smiley. If you're like me, 60 and retired, making ends meet, especially here at the supermarket and drugstore is tough. I'm so blessed to have found BenefitsCheckup.org. It's a free and confidential website from the National Council on Aging that connected me to $1,200 a year in programs that help pay for food, medicine, utilities, and more. Maybe it can help you. BenefitsCheckup.org My daughter was diagnosed with a rare malignant rhabdoid tumor on the spine. They sent her straight to St. Jude. My hope was gone. But when you get there, everyone's like, hey, we're not going to give up. And when you see other people not giving up on your child, that makes all the difference in the world. When I found out I didn't have to pay, I was just grateful. They saved my baby's life. Finding Cures, Saving Children. Learn more at stjude.org. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is facing criticism from citizens accusing him of enacting policies that made the recent Jacksonville mass shooting possible. He had a heated exchange with an audience member at a news conference. A man blamed DeSantis' policies for hurting people like him. The August shooting left three black victims dead. The man also brought up Trayvon Martin, the black teen who was killed in 2012 in Florida before DeSantis interrupted him, saying he wasn't involved with that incident. About two in three Democrat voters say they'd rather see a different nominee than President Biden. That's according to a new CNN poll that says 67 percent of left-leaning voters would like the party to nominate someone other than Biden. That's up from 54 percent who said the same back in March. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Come to Dodger Stadium on September 19th when the boys in blue take on the Tigers for Dia de los Dodgers, presented by Hornitos. Purchase a special ticket pack to receive an exclusive jersey. For tickets and more information, visit Dodgers.com slash ticket packs. Explore September sales at Whole Foods Market. Save 33% on all supplements with Prime through September 12th. Power your day with your favorite dietary supplements by brands you trust. While supplies last, shop in-store or online. Terms apply. 
Is this the title? This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. I'm a bad man. Serena Williams was 17 when she won her first U.S. Open championship in 1999. Coco Gauff is 19. She's one victory away from following in her idol's footsteps as a rising teenager. Coco defeated Carolina Machova of the Czech Republic in straight sets to advance to Saturday's title match. Coco will play Irina Sabalenka of Belarus. The Dodgers get a shutout win last night in Miami. Mookie Betts was on crutches after the game. He fouled a pitch off his left foot in the second inning. Six weeks ago, Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert was the NFL's highest paid player with an average salary of $52.5 million. That title now belongs to Cincinnati Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow. Burrow signed a five-year deal worth $275 million, an average of $55 million per year. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. Hey, this is Zoe Williams, the voice of reason from KBLA Talk 1580. Listen, if you're in the market for the best prices and the fastest delivery for custom-made roller shades, LA Custom Blinds is the place to be. Schedule a free estimate, and they will come to your house, measure your windows, and bring a variety of fabrics to choose from. And then come back and install it all for free. The best part is that their factory is located right here in downtown Los Angeles. So they make the shades really fast. All you got to do is go to LACustomBlinds.com and schedule your free in-home estimate right now. Tell them Zoe Williams sent you. Be ready for extreme heat in your area. On days when extreme heat is expected, take action to keep your home as cool as possible. Set your air conditioner to 78 degrees. If AC isn't available, close blinds and curtains on all windows and run fans counterclockwise or find your nearest cooling center. Transportation help may be available. Learn more at heatreadyca.com. Brought to you by the state of California. He's rooting for everybody black. Everybody black. black. More Tavis Smiley coming your way right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Our guest in this hour is uh, the brilliant Samuel G. Friedman, one of the nation's most distinguished journalists. And I'm honored once again in my career to uh, engage him in dialogue uh, for an hour. Um, His new book is called Into the Bright Sunshine, Young Hubert Humphrey and the Fight for Civil Rights. We've been talking in this hour about what uh, uh, Humphrey and Randolph and Eleanor Roosevelt and Walter White and others were up against in that moment, that dark moment of American history then, and the moral and political courage that was required, that was in fact required to advance uh, that moment. Uh, Comparing that to where we are today, it's another dark moment. Uh, We are clearly uh, on the night side, the dark side, one could argue, of this American democracy. Uh, And uh, there's going to be a, a great deal of moral and political courage required uh, to get us through the moment that we are in now. We will get to that because I I don't see that moral and political courage uh, uh, on display right now. And we'll talk about that as we move through this hour. But I I, I don't want to get too too ahead of myself because what I want to hear and want you to hear is the story of how a young 37-year-old Hubert Humphrey uh, took the podium at the July 1948 Democratic Convention in Philadelphia and convinced Democrats for the first time ever to really advance a a true narrative, um, to do some real work uh, on the issue of civil rights. So tell me, Samuel Friedman, what Hubert Humphrey said that day at 37, he got all these folks in line behind him. Yeah, thank you, Tavis. Uh, Let me frame it a little bit contextually first. Please. Because the the environment politically is very different in some ways from what we're living in today, in the sense that right now we associate – the Republican Party with the party of racism, white supremacy, racial, structural, systemic inequality. But back in the 1940s, that was one part of the Democratic Party. The New Deal coalition that Franklin Roosevelt put together had, you know, people you'd expect in it, organized labor, immigrant Catholics and Jews, college-educated intellectuals. But it also had this devil's bargain of including the all-white Jim Crow Democratic Party in the South. And FDR had calculated that he couldn't win the election without the electoral votes of the Solid South, as they called it. He couldn't get his programs through Congress without the support of these very powerful Southern senators and congressmen. And so he appeased them. He let New Deal legislation like the Social Security Act be written to omit agriculture and domestic labor which meant a huge share of black workers in the South. 
He let New Deal programs be implemented locally, which meant Jim Crow states could implement them in a totally unequal way. And when it came to the party platform, he left any language of civil rights all vague and fuzzy and ambiguous so the white Southerners could claim it supported what they called states' rights, Mm -hmm. meaning their right in their states to have apartheid. And by the 1948 convention, this was to Humphrey and his allies intolerable. It was morally indefensible. It was also morally indefensible amid the Cold War when the U.S. is trying to say to the soon-to-be liberated countries in Africa and South America, the Middle East, the Caribbean basin, you should align with the liberal democracy rather than uh, the communist system. And they're saying, how can we make that argument when we tolerate segregation and the Soviet Union espouses racial equality? So that was another part of the moral um, vision of it. But Humphrey, as you said, he's a kid, politically speaking. Mm -hmm. He's 37 years old. He's held one office in his whole life, mayor of Minneapolis, only for three years. And he's going up against Harry Truman, who, though with points Truman had begun to move forward on civil rights, then he went in reverse, looking at the 48 election. He said, I'm going to do the FDR thing, you know, buy off the South with compromises, hopefully get their votes. Nothing about civil rights should be in the platform. Um, Then you have the Dixiecrats led by Strom Thurmond, and a name you'll recognize from being a Mississippian fielding right, Mm -hmm. who was the governor then of Mississippi and actually the creator of the Dixiecrat movement and the Dixiecrat party. And they're saying, if there's a word about civil rights in this platform, we're walking out and we're going to run a protest candidate. And the point of that, and oh man, Tavis, this is like the past of the present. Mm. Their point was to make sure neither Truman nor Tom Dewey won a majority of electoral votes. So it goes to the House of Representatives. And who's sitting in the pivotal position? All the white Southerners. Mm. They're going to get to choose the next president. Um, And Truman's people at the convention are telling Humphrey that if you give the speech, your career is over. Mm. Truman, in his diaries, calling Humphrey and the civil rights people crackpots. Mm. And Humphrey was definitely, you know, part of him very filled with trepidation about giving his, his speech. But he had, you know, the support of A. Philip Randolph's mass movement marching. He had support from family members and he even got the support, surprisingly, of some big city machine politicians who could see what the demographic future was and said, if our party can't appeal to black voters, you know, we're toast. Yeah. And and then with all that, Humphrey gets up and there are 60 million people listening on radio. There are 10 million people watching on TV, which was just starting to get wired through the Northeast. Mm-hmm. And he gives this speech, and the two famous phrases from it are saying that for those who say that it's too soon to move on civil rights, Humphrey says, I say it's 172 years late, mm-hmm. which when you do the math means going back to 1776. Mm-hmm. And then he says to those who say this program is an infringement on states' rights, I say it's time for the Democratic Party to walk forthright, to leave the shadow of states' rights and walk, walk forthrightly, and as the title of my book, into the bright sunshine of human rights. And these are these two electrifying phrases, Tavis. And what's powerful, you can find the audio of this on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Listen to the boos. This was a big risk. Mm. Yeah, there was a lot of cheering in the convention hall. But there was a lot of booing, and it was so controversial that the convention was halted soon after, and they wouldn't let the vote on the civil rights plank take place till they gave like an hour-long recess hoping people would calm down. Well, it didn't calm down because what Humphrey's platform plank said was not general language support of civil rights. It said desegregate the military pass anti-lynching legislation, outlaw the poll tax, also outlaw discrimination along the lines of of religion and national origin, which affected Jews, Catholics, Japanese Americans, Mexican Americans. So it was very explicit. And after it passed, a name that will live in infamy, no no other than Bull Connor, Mm. later the police chief of Birmingham, you know, starts this massive Southern protest, and they as threatened, march out of the convention hall. Mm. 
And um, two weeks later, Harry Truman desegregates the military and desegregates the federal workforce because they, the convention had given him no choice but to run on civil rights. Nothing like a little pressure. Nothing like a little exactly. pressure. Exactly. Uh, pressure brought by a young 37-year-old Hubert Humphrey that made Harry Truman do the right thing. So for you historians out there, you uh, history lovers, uh, we know the story that Truman gets the credit for desegregating the military. But now you know the backstory of how Truman got pushed to do that. Um, great presidents aren't born, they're made. And if you become a great president, you have to be pushed into your greatness. There is no uh, FDR if there's no A. Philip Randolph pushing him. Uh, there is no uh, Abraham Lincoln, to go back further, if there's no Frederick Douglass, uh, the aforementioned Frederick Douglass, pushing him. There is no LBJ if there's no MLK pushing him. Great presidents are not born, they are made, uh, and left to their own devices, they end up, how might I put it, being garden variety politicians. They'll never become statesmen if somebody ain't pushing them into their greatness. And so you know the story of Truman desegregating the military, but now you know how he got there. A young 37-year-old Hubert Humphrey pushed him and the entire Democratic Party in Philadelphia to put that plank in the platform, and the rest, as they say, is history, told brilliantly and beautifully by our guest, Samuel G. Friedman. When we come forward, Samuel, I want to ask you whether or not you think there is some connection, some connection, uh, between Humphrey still being... uh, for the most part, regarded as a loser in this country politically. Is there a connection between that loser label and the fact that his greatest achievement, one of his greatest achievements, was advancing the notion of civil and human rights? I think you take my point. That's a loser agenda, right? So you you get regarded as a loser, never mind the fact that you're the one that pushed the Democratic Party to finally take seriously the issue of civil rights. And But for this book, that history really has not been known heretofore. We'll talk about it more when we come forward on Tavis Smiley. Unapologetically progressive, progressive. unapologetically blind. Black, black, black. You're tapped into Tavis Smiley. Tavis Smiley. Smiley. What is dedication? My biggest fear in the middle of my addiction was that my kids wouldn't have a father. And I started thinking, you know what? This isn't my story. I definitely had to become a better man to be a better father. It's important to me that my kids are empowered and truly believe that if if they can think it, they can do it. That's dedication. Visit fatherhood.gov to hear more. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Joey from Vermont. A farmer trying to get through the winter. Adriana from South Carolina. A single mother living paycheck to paycheck. Liam from Ohio. An injured father struggling to provide for his family. Hi, I'm Shanola Hampton. And I support the Feeding America network of food banks because they help provide over 6 billion meals to people in need each year. Learn more at feedingamerica.org. Hi, it's Tavis Smiley. KBLA Talk 1580 is inviting you to join us on Saturday, September 16th, 10 a.m. to 1230 p.m. for our very first economic empowerment event for the community. This event is free and it's powered by Caltrans. We're doing this in association with Rambo House. And here's Rambo to tell you more. Contracts, contracts, contracts. I'm going to say it again for all of us small business owners out there. Contracts, contracts, contracts. Rambo House, KBLA, Tavis, me. Oh, my God, this is going to be massive. I truly thank Caltrans for giving us the opportunity to focus on contracts. Listen, that's what it's all about to be a small business in L.A. That's how we hire our own. That's how we expand our community is contracts. KBLA1580.com is for you to have a seat at our contracts-focused event. Contract Ready does it again. We had over 900 last time. So you guys know how exciting this is. And if you just think, think that you want to get into contracts and you're close to it, bring your friends out for September 16th at the Marriott Hotel. Listen, you know where to register, kbla1580.com. Come see me. I can't wait to see you. Let's do it, Tavis. So be sure to go to kbla1580.com for all the details. We'll see you Saturday, September 16th. Hello, I'm Will Jimeno. I'm a retired Port Authority police detective and an island survivor. For 13 hours, I was buried under the rubble of the World Trade Center. I was rescued thanks to brave people who were willing to put their own lives on the line to save mine. For 9-11 this year, a national day of service, I'll be paying it forward by taking time to help others. Please join me by doing your own good deed that day. Visit 911day.org to learn more. 
More honesty than you can handle. More empowerment than you can imagine. You're tuned in to Tavis Smiley. Smiley. Senator G. Friedman, um, American history historians uh, have um, uh, long put the loser label on Hubert Humphrey. Here you come now with this story of what um, Humphrey did uh, courageously to push the Democratic Party, to push that Democratic convention in Philadelphia back in 1948 to do the right thing on civil rights. My question is whether or not uh, that loser label has anything to do with the fact that one of his greatest accomplishments was, in fact, on the issue of civil and human rights. Um, I think it definitely is part of that. Look, I have to say, Tav, as part of the hit Humphrey took to his reputation is deserved. He came out in favor of the Vietnam War Mm -hmm. for a long time, um, and that was a mistake. He later owned up to it. He received the Democratic nomination for convention in 1968 amid the police riot against journalists and and anti-war protesters at the Chicago convention. And then, you know, he ran for the Democratic nomination in 72 against George McGovern, who's the peace candidate, Mm -hmm. and also Shirley Chisholm. He looked like the Humphrey looked like the old tired old establishment. So to some extent, um, the critical you know, disparaging view of him is is valid as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. But I think that what he accomplished in the 40s and a lot of what the civil rights movement of the 40s was all about, including people like Randolph and White, has been ignored or forgotten. We often think that the movement begins with Rosa Parks and Dr. King and the Montgomery bus boycott and Brown versus Board of Ed and, you know, moving forward valiantly, you know, heroically through the lunch counter sit-ins and the freedom rides and the civil rights legislation that LBJ and Humphrey and MLK pushed through. But in the 40s, there was an incredible amount of activity that set the table for all of it. And Humphrey has been forgotten for his role in that. And I think so largely have Walter White and A. Philip Randolph. They also don't get their props. You know their story. Your listeners know their story. But if you go to a typical American who thinks they know something about civil rights and you ask, you know, who was A. Philip Randolph, who was Walter White, a lot of people are going to come up blank. You know, Mm -hmm. parenthetically, it's one of the reasons I'm excited about this film about Bayard Rustin coming out. Because it, you know, can help to fill some of those gaps. No, we had a great talk about Bayard Rustin um, uh, last week, I guess, on the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. I started our program that day wanting our audience to be more empowered and more knowledgeable about the grand contributions of Bayard Rustin's. We started our program all three hours that day dedicated to the history of that march 60 years ago. But we started uh, in dialogue about uh, the work and witness of one Bayard Rustin. When we come forward, um, since you went there, I will follow you in right quick with the few moments I have left. Dr. King was right about the war in Vietnam, and he paid a heavy price for it. I wrote a book called Death of a King about the last year of his life and the hell that he caught uh, in part uh, for coming out to give that Beyond Vietnam speech. Uh, and so the end of his life is not as it was back in 63 at the March on Washington. Uh, but but I'm curious as to how Dr. King was so right about that and everybody else, including Humphrey, was so wrong. Samuel Friedman is our guest right now on Tavis Smiley. This is getting good. Yeah, man. Tavis Smiley, Tavis Smiley continues when we come forward. forward, forward, forward. What's up, party people? It's your favorite MC's favorite rapper, MC Light here. And we're celebrating 50 years of hip-hop, authentically powered by Cadillac. And we're going to take it way back to where it started. It was only fitting that hip-hop began with teenagers at a back-to-school jam in the rec room of a South Bronx apartment complex by an 18-year-old brother. By the way, I'm also sure he had a Cadillac parked outside. He noticed the energy on the dance floor when he switched between two turntables, extending the beats, repeating the breaks, and never losing the rhythms. And that was the birth of hip-hop. And from that moment, it took off. For more on how Cadillac is celebrating hip-hop's 50th, visit Cadillac.com forward slash audacity. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Tired of being locked out of job opportunities and shut down by systemic racism? KBLA stands with you in fighting for the rights of black workers, and we don't black down. 
The Los Angeles Black Workers Center is a dynamic alliance of workers, organized labor, community-based organizations, clergy, students, and scholars working collectively to improve the position of the black working class. The LA Black Workers Center takes a comprehensive approach to addressing the black jobs crisis. Their programs promote access to quality jobs, racial equity in hiring and retention, discrimination-free job sites, and they prepare black workers for employment in high-wage, career-track jobs. The Black Workers Center supports workers who need help protecting their rights on the job. They give workers access to quality jobs and remove systemic barriers to employment. To sign up for free career readiness training, get involved in organizing around anti-discrimination, learn about union apprenticeship programs, or sign on to a trade registry, please visit www.lablackworkerscenter.org. That's lablackworkerscenter.org. Together, we can beat the black jobs crisis. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. More honesty than you can handle. More empowerment than you can imagine. You're tuned in to Tavis Smiley. Smiley. Helping, to, Helping make to make you the most knowledgeable person in your circle of friends. This is Tavis Smiley. There are a number of things Samuel Friedman, uh, Dr. King, was fond of saying that come to mind immediately, uh, not the least of which is that there is some good in the best of us, some good rather in the worst of us, some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. Mm -hmm. And King was clear that he did not have a monopoly on the truth. There is the truth and there is the way to the truth. And you've got to be humble enough to know that there are others who are working their way to the truth and you can't be arrogant with the truth that you know, even as you're obligated to to, to say what you see, to share the truth with the public that you know at any given time. So King had a, had a humility about him when it came uh, to the truth and uh, others being uh, you know, given the time to, to make their way uh, to the truth. That said, he, he, he held no prisons when it came to his critique, as you know, of LBJ and the war uh, in Vietnam. My question right quick, we've only got three or four minutes left in this conversation. I want to do two or three things uh, in that time. Number one, how did Dr. King get that so right? And and LBJ and McNamara and Humphrey and others get it so wrong. It's the worst. It's the worst I, part of American history. Uh, I agree that about them getting it wrong. And Dr. King, in his brilliant radicalism, which I use as a word of praise, getting it right. Sure. I think as Dr. King saw that there were efforts around the world to decolonize for countries to liberate themselves from the former empires, national liberation movements. And I think he understood that what was going on in Vietnam was part of that. And the alternate view, which proved to be a very flawed view, which Humphrey and LBJ and McNamara and others held, was this idea of the Cold War, that everything that's happening in the world, whether it's in Vietnam or Nigeria or Guatemala, you name it, is a gigantic chessboard on which it's the U.S. versus the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. And, you know, and you have to fight against or use proxies to fight against anyone perceived to be a Soviet ally. And that turned out to be a really damaging, you know, blinkered view of the world. Sure. And Dr. King's view has been ratified by history. Yeah. Um, so Hubert Humphrey, um, two minutes I have left here. Hubert Humphrey was wrong, uh, very wrong in 68. But morally and politically courageous in 48 he was obviously going in the wrong direction <laughs> he, he was he was morally well, he always kept his yeah. views on racial justice though. yeah and you know he did do that and one of the last things he did in congress when he was back in the senate in the 70s yeah. was try to push through a full employment sure. bill so even after vietnam he held true to the north star of his best ideals so in these last 60 seconds tell me what uh the takeaway is from Hubert Humphrey when it comes to having moral and political courage in dark times like these? The takeaway, Tavis, in, in Into the Bright Sunshine, is here's someone who gave up his white privilege mm. to work, as you said, in the band oh, yeah. with black Americans. He was a white guy from the tiniest little white place out in eastern South Dakota who had barely been around black people in his life till he went to grad school for a year at LSU, which blew his mind and opened his eyes. And he could have coasted along on being part of the white Protestant majority, especially in a place like Minnesota. And instead, he put his life literally at risk to work with blacks, yeah. to work with Jews, to work with progressives. And, you know, that's a life. Yeah. He is one of the best um, in our profession, one of the nation's most distinguished journalists, always honored and humbled. 
to be in dialogue with Samuel G. Friedman. His book is called Into the Bright Sunshine, Young Hubert Humphrey and the Fight for Civil Rights. Uh, Samuel, thank you for the text. Thank you for the conversation. I appreciate you, sir. All the best to you, my friend. Well, thank you, my brother, for the honor of being with you. It is always something that makes me feel grateful. You're kind. I appreciate it. More of Tavis Smotty when we come forward. KBLA 1580 Santa Monica. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is facing criticism from citizens accusing him of enacting policies that made the recent Jacksonville mass shooting possible. He had a heated exchange with an audience member at a news conference. A man blamed DeSantis' policies for hurting people like him. The August shooting left three black victims dead. The man also brought up Trayvon Martin, the black teen who was killed in 2012 in Florida before DeSantis interrupted him, saying he wasn't involved with that incident. About two in three Democrat voters say they'd rather see a different nominee than President Biden. That's according to a new CNN poll that says 67 percent of left-leaning voters would like the party to nominate someone other than Biden. That's up from 54 percent who said the same back in March. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Come to Dodger Stadium on September 19th when the boys in blue take on the Tigers for Dia de los Dodgers, presented by Hornitos. Purchase a special ticket pack to receive an exclusive jersey. For tickets and more information, visit Dodgers.com slash ticket pack. Is this the Tiger? This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. I'm a bad man. Serena Williams was 17 when she won her first U.S. Open championship in 1999. Coco Golf is 19. She's one victory away from following in her idol's footsteps as a rising teenager. Coco defeated Carolina Muchova of the Czech Republic in straight sets to advance to Saturday's title match. Coco will play Arina Sabalenka of Belarus. The Dodgers get a shutout win last night in Miami. Mookie Betts was on crutches after the game. He fouled a pitch off his left foot in the second inning. Six weeks ago, Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert was the NFL's highest paid player with an average salary of $52.5 million. That title now belongs to Cincinnati Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow. Burrow signed a five-year deal worth $275 million, an average of $55 million per year. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your K. BLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580 is dedicated to empowering our communities by providing progressive talk radio for our audience. We strive to be an intersectional voice for the voiceless. As a Black-owned and operated station, we are committed to highlighting diverse perspectives and creating safe spaces for meaningful dialogue. We believe that everyone has something unique to bring to these political, economic, social, and cultural conversations. And we don't shy away from the hard conversations about current events. We endeavor to be a beacon of hope and understanding while boldly challenging listeners to think more deeply about difficult topics that impact us all. With this in mind, our mission statement at KBLA Talk 1580 is simple. To create an inclusive platform that promotes civil discourse through honest dialogue and encourages personal growth among our listeners so they can become the active agents of change. Our vision is to establish ourselves as the premier radio network with relevant programming across the beloved community, connecting people through shared experiences and collective power for lasting impact beyond these challenging times. Welcome to the best of Tavis Smiley on KBLA Talk 1580. I 
Max, it's been too long, man. How you been? I'm good. How you doing, bro? Man, if I complained, I'd be an ingrate. I am doing well, and I'm always better when I hear when I hear your 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 voice. And I thank you once again for the opportunity uh, to talk to you. Um, uh, let me uh, let me make the most of the time that we have. Uh, you've been you've been moving this summer. Before I get to the, the tour that you're you're presently on, um, how did you enjoy the time with Anthony Hamilton and Joe? Oh, it was great. It was great. I mean, it was it was. It was a, it was uh, one of those things that you 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 can't believe you did mm -hmm. and that you survived <laughs> because <laughs> it, it was literally you know just, you know I guess the pandemic had like sort of chilled out and so we we kind of went out at the right time and by the time we were done you know the numbers started to rise again but just the whole process of you know trying to get out there and rally for life so to speak. Yeah. Um, I couldn't imagine two greater people to go out there and do it. And it was, it was incredible for me. I was surprised. I couldn't believe all the people who showed up. Mm, man, I had, please. I had no idea people <laughs> were going to come through cause, because literally it was just like, you know, we were in a pandemic and, you know, I just said, hey, you know, we'll see what happens. And, but there were people in the house. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm just glad that we all survived it. Man, That's you, all I can say. You, if, you, if you tell Negroes that Maxwell and Anthony Hamilton and Joe are going to be in an arena together, <laughs> you ain't got to worry about black folks showing up, man. They're they going to be there in droves uh, as, I, oh, as they were. I'm, well, I'm glad they came. I mean, look, I always say this. You know, I never take it for granted. I never, I, I never take, um, you know, I, I always look at it as a blessing and, and – uh, I keep my, my my humble cap on when it comes to those types of things because at any moment, at any time, it can be taken from me. So I'm yeah. just grateful to those people who, who came through and, 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 and we had a good time. And especially with Joe, because, um, I mean, you know, he's got so many songs. He's mm -hmm. just like, damn, I'm really that one. And then Anthony as well. So it was a great, it was a great night, yeah. you know, and it was a great uh, thing. We did a, a wonderful partnership with the Black Promoters on – collective and yeah. that was nice to uh to kind of do that um I love there's it. so many levels to, to it so so yeah, yeah. no I, I love it when black folk come together and work together and everybody succeeds it's a beautiful thing so i'm glad you uh yeah. i gave the black collective the promoters collective a chance to, to work with you on that tour obviously you're the headliner have been and always will be um I, i'm fascinated um because you've got some different folk uh, uh with you for the nights you're going to be at the hollywood bowl in in southern california mm -hmm. uh, this program is syndicated across the nation but of course flagship here in la so we'll talk about your hollywood um, bowl dates in a moment uh, but but I'm fascinated to ask you, how is it that you go about deciding who you're going to jail with? And I don't mean, you know, personality wise. I mean, when you put together a, a bill and again, you're the headliner, so you have you have the final say. How do you know, like what works, what's going to work on tour in, in terms of the people that you're touring with? Because I'm a fan. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm literally a fan of the music that they do. Mm hmm. Um, you know, Ravenna and, and Sir, uh, Pink Sweats. I mean, uh, even with the crews that we're doing, you know, Sabrina Claudio, Robert Glasper, Lettucey, uh, Gallant, um, Music Souls Child. I mean, I'm just a fan, and I'm just trying to see if I can, you know, trick my audience into following them <laughs> to a degree. Because, because especially in this day and age, it's funny, I was reading something, uh, I was seeing an article about how hard it is for, I mean, the play, the way uh, music is, is now, you know, obviously, yeah. the playlists. So sometimes you know the song, but you don't know the artist. And you know the voice, but you don't know the face. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very hard for, the, for these incredible artists to get an audience because people are just, you know, like, go, you know, tapping in R&B and chill or Latin and chill or mm -hmm. whatever playlists that they, they that they mess with and so all these people get grouped together because of an algorithm but they don't necessarily people don't necessarily know who they are and i do because you know i'm from back in the day when you bought a record and you watched a show or you read up about an artist and some people you know are much more relaxed about how they experience music so the reason why i try to bring all these uh incredible artists out is, is so that the people can you know see them and see their faces and go, oh, you're the one that sings that song, you know? Oh my mm -hmm. God, even, you know? And so that's a, it's a good way to sort of keep good music moving, you yeah. know, because there's so much, 
there's so much stuff that's not necessarily great. And, um, and sometimes it's, you know, uh, I, I, look, I'm not here to judge what other artists do or what I think is good or bad, but, mm -hmm. you know, I just try to stand behind the, the ones that I, I love. And so yeah. I'm just grateful to be able to do that. It's, you know? it's, it's good to be the king and, and pick the folk that you want to hang out with. <laughs> pick people whose <laughs> well, music you like to go on tour with you. I ain't mad at you, I, man. I, I wouldn't say king. I would definitely say, you know, uh, you know, 